Hello everyone, my name is Tuli Zialala and welcome to episode 2 of Good Vibes with Tuli. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm really excited about today's episode. Thank you for subscribing to the channel and thank you for the positive feedback and comments that you've been getting. Many people have asked me how I became a SATI accredited professional SASL interpreter. How long does it take? What did you study? And what steps did you follow to get to where you are? So today I hope to share my little pearls of wisdom and empower other people who are considering becoming professional SASL interpreters. Please note that everyone's journey in life is different and everyone's calling in life is different. Although I will be sharing my tips on how I got to where I am today, the outcome for you may be different. What's important is that you embrace your own journey and you follow your heart. Do what feels right for you. When the time is right, you will know naturally what you need to do. So my journey began all the way back in 2008. I studied at Wits University. I enrolled for a BA degree with the hopes of becoming a clinical psychologist. My second major was SASL, South African Sign Language. And at the time, I was just curious and fascinated about the language. Little did I know that one day I'd become a professional interpreter. It's important to know that I worked my way up and I learned the language. I became fluent in the language. I learned the grammar the rules and the structure of the language and that's something that i'd like to share with you today you first need to become fluent in the choice of language whether it's spoken or visual in this case sasl people have the big misconception that you just need to know the basics of the language and then you quickly become an interpreter that is not true you first need to be fluent in the language and then you learn how to become an interpreter. It took me four years to learn and to become fluent in the language just by studying it. I did my undergrad and then I continued with my honours in SASL. When I decided that I wanted to become a professional interpreter, I enrolled for an honours in interpreting. Here I learned the strategies, the techniques, the tools and the skill of interpreting. Here we learn how to practically apply these strategies and these techniques in real life situations. How do you cope with stress when you're interpreting a live TV broadcast? What techniques and strategies and tools can you practically apply at the time to make sure that you don't compromise the message and the client is always satisfied. This is what we learned when we did our honors in interpreting. What's also important to know is that you need to be active in the community that you serve. So I was very active and involved in the deaf community. This is the best way to build trust with the people that you will be one day serving. Stay plugged in and get involved as much as you can. One way is to volunteer in organizations or in your community, but just make sure that you always stay around the deaf community. It's also important to know the culture and the shared values practically firsthand. It's one thing to learn a language and learn the culture from a book, but it's something else to engage and experience and see for yourself what the people are like and what their daily lives are like. 
this is the best way to quickly learn the language to know the people to make friends to build trust and to learn about the culture so my second tip is to be active and plugged in in your community coupled with that is mentorship i was fortunate to have mentors who helped me along my journey you guys may see me sitting here but truly i am standing on the shoulders of giants such as Thelma Gutierrez, Ketri Dutoy, Natasha Maligo and these are people who have helped me and built me up and guided me along the journey. Mentors are important because they've got the experience and they know what is best for you. This is also the best way to build trust with someone. If you are not sure about your career journey, then ask someone who's done it before. When I wanted to become a Satya accredited interpreter, it was my mentors who were the ones who guided me and gave me tips on what to do. When I applied for my Satya accredited interpreting exam in 2017, unfortunately the first time I failed and I had to go back again and try in 2018. And that was when I was successful. I don't think I'd be able to sit here in front of you saying that I'm a Satya accredited interpreter had my mentors not been there for me. Mentorship is so crucial for trust, for professionalism, for experience and for guidance. And I'm so thankful for the mentors who played a big role for me in my life and in my career. With all the things that I've mentioned, it's a personal decision. Once you decide what you want to do for your life, in this case, becoming a professional SASL interpreter, please note that it's not an easy journey. It is an investment that takes years and years. I've been in the industry for over 10 years and I'm still learning. When I decided in 2008 that I'm going to study to become an interpreter, I had to plant seeds and these seeds don't grow immediately. It takes time. You need to practice over and over again. And that's one thing I'd like to share with you today is that you must be patient, you must be persistent, and you must be consistent as well. Please don't give up, it is possible, but you are responsible to plant the seeds and to make sure that you nurture the seeds with the people that you surround yourself with and the environment that you are going to surround yourself with. So with that said, my biggest point for you today is just start. If you've started, keep going, keep going and don't give up. You will get there. Today's featured content is by someone I look up to tremendously. They call him the Black Steve Jobs and his name is Mesh. Mashudu is a prominent podcaster and I have been fortunate enough to engage with him. He is one of the most chilled people that I know. He's so easygoing and he's so approachable. He's the founder of the prominent podcasting network called Lucha. And I'm so grateful because he is so generous with his knowledge, his tips, and he lives by the philosophy of opening up the market and making sure that everyone has equal opportunity to make it in the podcasting career and market. I think that both of us, as we are prominent and influential people in our respective industries, me as an interpreter and him as a podcaster, I also share the same philosophy of sharing my journey, my tips, and my knowledge in making sure that other up and coming SSL interpreters are just as influential and successful in their career. I'd like to thank you, Mesh, for just being so open and generous with your information. Thank you for sharing how you started with your journey and thank you for imparting your pearls of wisdom. So today we'll be featuring Mesh and he's talking about how he started 
his podcasting journey and how he became a podcaster. He's been sharing his tips and I hope that you guys will enjoy and learn a thing or two as much as I have learned. Thank you so much. That's it for today. And there's going to be more exciting opportunities and episodes from me next week. Please subscribe to the channel and please, please give us feedback. Your comments and your feedback is very welcome. That's all from me today with Good Vibes from Tuli and enjoy. So just start off with, thank you for coming. I appreciate it. So please give yourselves a round of applause just for that. Cool. So three months ago, Apple Podcasts reached out to me and said, hey dude, we think you're doing something amazing. We want to speak to you. Mainly what they wanted to understand is what the fuck is going on. So an organization like Apple didn't understand what was actually happening with creatives in South Africa. How wild is that? that a company like Apple doesn't have enough data to say, okay, this is what's definitively happening in the ecosystem. And they needed a guy like me who pretends to know everything that he can, <laughs> right? So this is the same presentation I gave to them, and I want you to have it so that you understand what's really happening and what I believe is going to happen in the future as well. Cool? So we at Lucha play an open game, right? I'm going to speak to some of that as well. Cool. Very simple, what we're trying to build is a podcast network. We want to create the best network or media company that really speaks to African millennials and Gen Z audiences and really speaks to stories that matter, right? So we're genuinely trying to build the vice of Africa. Very simple, but we're building it backwards. So instead of, instead of starting with, vid, with, with writing, video, and then audio, we're starting with audio mainly because it's the low-hanging fruit which no one was paying attention to. Cool. Very simple, our network currently is about five podcasts. So my podcast was sort of the first podcast that we did. So this came from a very, it doesn't even make sense how I found podcasts, right? When you get an iPhone, the first thing you delete is all the apps you don't want. And the first one that comes to it is the podcast app. You delete that app because you don't actually know what the hell is inside there but there was an entire world that I didn't know about, right? And it took, I was at a sort of lunch thing with Facebook executives, and I was sitting next to this lady, and she, she asked me, she said, what are media in South Africa doing to document the journey of entrepreneurs in South Africa in, a, in an honest way? I said, we don't do that. Here, we do victory laps. We don't do the struggle. We don't talk about the process. We don't talk about any of that because, oh, shit, that would be very traumatic, right? And she said, you should listen to this podcast. It's called Startup. I was like, what is it? And she said, this is the best documentation you'll ever have of a guy starting a podcast. So the first thing you need to do after this whole thing, listen to a podcast called Startup, because it is genuinely the best thing you'll ever listen to. And it's also something that will really empower you to see the journey for what it really is, instead of the victory lap. So our mission and vision are very, very clear. Create valuable and impactful content that changes the African youth narrative and the vision, become an industry-leading platform for millennial content in Africa. So the second one, we're sort of getting there, mainly because if someone like Apple, who only has a deal, so the whole meeting happened and they were like, hey, you're cool, whatever. That whole meeting was about one thing. We want to give you the tools to enable you to use the platform the way it's supposed to be used. Currently, most podcasters, you use the platform the way you think it's supposed to be used. They gave us an email that is three days long, right? That literally gives you guidelines on how to put a description in, your artwork, how to upload, what's the best podcast provider, all these sort of best practices. The only people that have that sort of agreement right now is us and Cliff Central. So the first thing we did to try and outrun the market was build these three things, right? So a podcast guide, mainly how to start, build, and grow a podcast, gave you everything, right? Which is counter to what the industry in South Africa really does in terms of creators. What's the first thing they do? They hold all the information and make sure that you don't know what the fuck is happening. Why? Because that keeps the industry small, and you don't know how to compete. We compete very differently. Our competition is we're going to help everyone, and then we're going to compete on, okay, who's actually better? 
because if you open the market, that's the only way. So secondly, we built the podcast library. The podcast library was for one reason, right? Every time I spoke to someone about podcasts, they said, where do I find them and which ones do I listen to? So we wanted to build a central place that anyone can find them, right? If you have a podcast, literally just DM us and we'll put it on there. No screening, no nothing. What we're trying to do is open up the market. So think about that 13 million people. If we're competing for 13 million people, how many of those people actually listen to podcasts, right? So our biggest platform to actually listen from is SoundCloud. That's where we get our numbers the most, but we've actually now removed SoundCloud as the host. Main reason, no podcast platform like Spotify or Apple will actually take you seriously if you're using SoundCloud because it's a music streaming platform. And yeah, so we've now replaced SoundCloud with IONO, which is a South African product that actually helps you pu publish podcasts in a much better way, faster way. It also has a way more da data as well, right? So analytics is super powerful for podcasters. For example, we realized that one of our podcasts, people weren't listening past the 20 minute mark. So the podcast was one hour long, but people wouldn't listen after 20 minutes. Literally, there was a drop off. So what do you do? You cut it to 20 minutes <laughs> or even 15, right? So stuff like that starts to inform the way you create and the way you put out your content as well. So SoundCloud, then Spotify, then Apple, then Google, and then other. Okay, so the reason why there's other, as soon as you add your podcast to Apple Podcasts, what it does is it syndicates across all podcast apps. So there's stuff like, uh, come, what's it, podcast something cost? There's a whole bunch of different podcast apps, and they all syndicate from Apple. So you don't actually engage with those platforms, but your podcast is there already. So this is how we prioritize them as well. So we'll put out Spotify first, then Apple, then Google. Cool. So these are the South African numbers, which is very rare. Um, so the current addressable market for podcasting in South Africa, 60 million, 4.2 million unique South African users using IONO FM, and then 20,000 audio files uploaded to IONO. So that 20,000 is literally creators, radio stations, podcasters, whatever it is, and you need to look at that number as literally the competition. So if 20,000 audio files are going up per month, like what is different about what you're doing in terms of content, in terms of delivery, in terms of music and the background, in terms of editing, experience, storytelling, that is vastly, disproportionately different and better than everyone else. Cool? And then the last one, 50% jump in podcast listeners in South Africa. That's probably going to be way higher next year. If we don't make an effort, right? So, for example, you think about things like buy black, um, support black business and stuff like that. This is not that vastly different, but it has a different tone, right? It's super important that we in this room and the people outside and everyone in the world, well, in the country, start to open up their minds to going, I really care about local. Not because I know the guy, but because it actually matters. If you guys aren't going to, aren't going to, uh, 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 wait, sorry. If you are not going to consume the content that South Africans are making in podcasts, in YouTube, in written, in blogs, in Instagram, whatever it is, who's supposed to do it? And it goes into small businesses as well. All these things, they matter. So this is a Yoko thing, which is shop the streets mainly around encouraging people to really start becoming conscious. And I want you guys to start being, becoming conscious, not only about where you shop, but what you click on. Because the time and the data that you spend on content that's not South African or not African is taking away from African creators. And we need to bring that back. So the more numbers and the more growth that you start to see in African creatives, South African creatives, the better or easier it is for brands to start investing in them in a very conscious way.